take me? Will you trust my son to run your life and not try to run it yourself? If so, answer, I do. If you answer, O oh God, I do, it becomes to you what the vows of wedlock become. It changes the course and direction and relationships of your life. Will you dare to trust his eternal wisdom? If so, then pray, O oh God the Father, forgive me for doubting. Thou art infinitely wise, and I need infinite wisdom in my ignorance. Take over my life, and be my wisdom, my righteousness, my sanctification. From here on I acknowledge that thou art eternally wise. Be my anchor and guiding star. It will change your whole life. Chapter 8 God's Sovereignty Know therefore this day, and consider it in thine heart, that the Lord, he is God in heaven above, and upon the earth beneath. There is none else. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 39 See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 39 through 40. Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? With him is strength and wisdom. The deceived and the deceiver are his. He leadeth counsellors away spoiled and maketh the judges fools. Why dost thou strive against him? For he giveth not account of any of his matters. Job chapter 12, verses 9 through 10, verses 16 through 17, chapter 33, verse 13. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 6. How great are his signs, and how mighty are his wonders! His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand, or say unto him, What doest thou? Daniel chapter 4, verse 3 and verse 35. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Nahum chapter 1 verse 3 To say that God is sovereign is to say that he is supreme over all things, that there is no one above him, that he is absolute Lord over creation. It is to say that his lordship over creation means that there is nothing out of his control, nothing that God hasn't foreseen and planned. It means that even the wrath of man must ultimately praise God, and the remainder of wrath God will restrain. Psalm 76, verse 10. It means that every creature on earth, in heaven and in hell, must ultimately bow the knee and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians chapter 2, verse 10. God's sovereignty logically implies His absolute freedom to do all that He wills to do. God's sovereignty does not mean that He can do anything, but it means He can do anything that He wills to do. The sovereignty of God and the will of God are bound up together. The sovereignty of God does not mean that God can lie, for God does not will to lie. God is truth, and therefore God cannot lie for he wills not to lie. God cannot break a promise, because to break a promise would be to violate his nature, and God does not will to violate his nature. Therefore it is silly to say that God can do anything. But it is scriptural to say that God can do anything he wills to do. God is absolutely free. No one can compel him, no one can hinder him, no one can stop him. God has freedom to do as he pleases, always, everywhere and forever. 
God's sovereignty means that if there's anybody in this wide world of sinful men that should be restful and peaceful in an hour like this, it should be Christians. We should not be under the burden of apprehension and worry because we are the children of a God who is always free to do as He pleases. There is not one rope or chain or hindrance upon Him because He is absolutely sovereign. God is free to carry out His eternal purposes to their conclusions. I have believed this since I first became a Christian. I had good teachers who taught me this, and I have believed it with increasing joy ever since. God does not play by ear or doodle or follow whatever happens to come into His mind or let one idea suggest another. God works according to the plans which He purposed in Christ Jesus before Adam walked in the garden, before the sun, moon, and stars were made. God, who has lived all our tomorrows and carries time in His bosom, is carrying out His eternal purposes. His eternal purposes will not change, however the prophetic teachers may change their minds or whatever contemporary theologians may decide is the right thing to believe. God Almighty has already given us His theology, and I don't give a snap of my finger for contemporary theology. I believe in theology, which is contemporary surely, but... It is also as ancient as the throne of God and as eternal as the eternities to come. And we Christians are in this mighty river being carried along by the sovereign purposes of God. The sovereignty of God involves all authority and all power. I think you can see instantly that God could never be sovereign without the power to bring about His will or the authority to exercise His power. Kings, presidents, and others who rule over men must have the authority to govern and the power to make good on that authority. A ruler cannot stand up and say, Do this, please, if you feel like doing it. He says, Do it, and then has an army and a police force behind him. He has authority to command and power to carry out his commands, and God has to have both of these. I can't conceive of a God who has power and no authority. Samson was a man who had power but no authority, and didn't know what to do with it. There are men who have authority but no power. The United Nations is a pathetic example of authority without power. In the Congo, for example, the UN stands up and says, We order you to do this and that. But the Congolese laugh and say, You and who else? And do as they please. Authority without the power to carry out that authority is a joke. Power without authority puts a man where he can't do anything. But God Almighty, to be sovereign, must have authority and power. We've already discussed how God is infinite in His perfections, one of which is His absolute power. God is omnipotent. He has all the power there is. The next question is, does God have the authority? I think it is rather foolish even to discuss it. Can anyone imagine God having to ask permission? Can anybody imagine the great God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, having to send out a memo to a higher authority and ask, Might I please roll this star over there, or do something with this galaxy? Can you imagine Him applying to a higher authority? To whom would God apply? Who is higher than the highest? Who was there before He was? Who is mightier than the Almighty? At whose throne would God kneel for authority? No, there is no one greater. I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6. There is a religion, Zoroastrianism, which is to my mind the best of the non-Christian, non-revelational religions. It postulates a theological duality. That is, it says that there are two gods, a good one and a bad one. It's a neat way of getting around things, you know. Ahura Mazda is the good god who made everything good. But then there was a rascal of a god named Ahriman. For everything good that Ahura Mazda made, Ahriman made something bad. Ahura Mazda made the sunshine, Ahriman made the snow. Ahura Mazda made love, and Ahriman made hate. Ahura Mazda made life, and Ahriman made death. There were two gods both of them creating. Now God Almighty declares this couldn't be so because He is the sole creator. The Bible tells us this about Jesus Christ our Lord. 
For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Colossians chapter 1, verses 16-17 through 17. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and God made all things that are therein. There was no other creating God. That is one attribute that God did not give to anybody else. God can impart some of his attributes, such as love, mercy, or kindness, but he can't impart the attribute that enables him to create. God Almighty alone is the creator. There are not two gods, only one. But sin is loose in the universe, and this I do not understand. It is called the mystery of iniquity, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. And it is said that it already works. This mystery of iniquity I do not understand. I do not know why a holy God could allow to let loose in his world this iniquitous thing. But I know that God contains it, and I know that God's plans took it into account. And I know that when God laid his plans for heaven and earth and the creation of Adam, he knew about sin and knew about its wild, fugitive presence in the universe. So he took it into account. Though this outlaw called sin is now in the heavens, it can no more change the purposes of God or frustrate the plans of God than an outlaw hiding in the wilds of Canada can prevent the work of this nation. God's Sovereignty and Free Will but if God is sovereign, what about man's free will? Maybe you would rather not have your mind troubled about this. Maybe you'd rather just rest. But to quote someone else, the business of a prophet of God is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. If you are comfortable, perhaps you need to be afflicted. And one of the best ways to afflict you is to get you thinking about divine things. The matter of man's free will versus God's sovereignty can be explained in this way. God's sovereignty means that he is in control of everything, that he planned everything from the beginning. Man's free will means that he can, any time he wants, make most any choice he pleases, within his human limitations, of course. Man's free will can apparently defy the purposes of God and will against the will of God. Now, how do we resolve this seeming contradiction? Down through the years... Two divisions of the church have attempted to resolve this dilemma in different ways. One division emphasizes the sovereignty of God, believing that God planned everything from the beginning, that God ordered that some would be saved and some lost, that Christ died for those who would be saved, but he didn't die for the others who would not be saved. That is actually what followers of John Calvin believe. On the other side, there are those who say that Christ died for all and that man is free to make his choice. But those who teach the sovereignty of God in this exclusive way say that if man is free to make a choice, then God isn't sovereign, because if a man can make a choice that God doesn't like, then God doesn't have his way. I've thought this through and come to a way to resolve this dilemma. I don't know anyone else who has expressed this same theory in preaching or writing. The theologians can straighten me out on this if I'm wrong. I preached this one time in the presence of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of the great English authorities in theology, and he didn't dispute it. He just smiled. He didn't say he believed it, but he didn't say that he didn't. But I'd like to give it to you and see what you think of it. God's sovereignty means absolute freedom, doesn't it? God is absolutely free to do anything he wants or wills to do, anywhere, anytime, forever. And man's free will means that man can make any choice he wants to make, even if he makes a choice against the will of God. There is where the theologians lock horns like two deer out in the woods and wallow around until they die. I refuse to get caught on either horn of that dilemma. Here is what I see. God Almighty is sovereign, free to do as he pleases. Among the things he is pleased to do is give me freedom to do what I please. And when I do what I please, I am fulfilling the will of God, not controverting it, for God in His sovereignty has sovereignly given me freedom to make a free choice. 
Even if the choice I make is not the one God would have made for me, His sovereignty is fulfilled in my making the choice. And I can make the choice because the great sovereign God, who is completely free, said to me, In my sovereign freedom I bestow a little bit of freedom on you. Now, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Joshua chapter 24 verse 15 Be good or be bad at your own pleasure. Follow me or don't follow me. Come on or go back. Go to heaven or go to hell. The Sovereign God has put the decision in your lap and said, This is yours. You must make that choice. And when I make a choice, I am fulfilling His sovereignty, in that He sovereignly wills that I should be free to make a choice. If I choose to go to hell, it's not what His love would have chosen, but it does not controvert nor cancel out His sovereignty. Therefore I can take John Calvin in one hand and Jacob Arminius in the other and walk down the street. Neither of them would walk with me, I'm sure, because Calvin would say I was too Arminian, and Arminius would say I was too Calvinistic. But I'm happy in the middle. I believe in the sovereignty of God and in the freedom of man. I believe that God is free to do as He pleases, and I believe that, in a limited sense, He has made man free to do as He pleases, within a certain framework, but not a very big one. After all, you're not free to do very many things— you're free to make moral choices, you're free to decide the color of your necktie, what food you'll have, and whom you'll marry, if she agrees, of course. You're free to do a few things, but not that many. But the things you are free to do are gifts from the God who is utterly free. Therefore, any time I make a choice, I am fulfilling the freedom God gave me, and therefore I am fulfilling God's sovereignty and carrying it out. To illustrate what I'm talking about, Suppose a ship leaves New York City bound for Liverpool, England, with a thousand passengers on board. They're going to take a nice, easy journey and enjoy the trip. Someone on board, usually the captain, is an authority who carries papers that say you are to bring this ship into the harbor in Liverpool. After they leave New York and wave to the people on shore, the next stop is Liverpool. That's it. They're out on the ocean. Soon they lose sight of the Statue of Liberty, but they haven't come yet in sight of the English coast. They are out floating around on the ocean. What do they do? Is everyone bound in chains, with the captain walking around with a stick to keep them in line? No. Over here is a shuffleboard court, over there is a tennis court and a swimming pool. Over here you can look at pictures, over there you can listen to music. The passengers are perfectly free to roam around as they please on the deck of the ship. But they're not free to change the course of that ship. It's going to Liverpool no matter what they do. They can jump off if they want to, but if they stay on board, they're going to Liverpool. Nobody can change that. And yet they're perfectly free within the confines of that ship. In the same way, you and I have our little lives. We are born, and God says, I have launched you onto the sea from the shore of birth. You are going to go into the little port we call death. In the meantime, you are free to romp around all you want. Just remember that you are going to answer for what you have done when you get over there. So we throw our weight around and make demands, declaring that we can do as we please. We boast about our freedom. We've got a little freedom, all right, but remember, we can't change God Almighty's course. God has said that those who follow Jesus Christ and believe in Him shall be saved, and those who refuse shall be damned. That's settled, eternally, sovereignly settled. But you and I have freedom in the meantime to do anything we want to do. And though most people think very little about it, we're going to answer for that some day, according to the sovereign will of God. God has certain plans that He is going to carry out. The Lord hath His way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Nahum chapter 1 verse 3 When God is carrying on his plans, he is moving in a certain direction. When the enemy comes along, exercising the little freedom God has given him to be an enemy of God, and intersects the will and purpose of God, then there's trouble. As long as we move in the will of God, everything goes smoothly. But when we get out of the will of God, then we have trouble on our hands. God made the heaven and the earth in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, but 
Then there was a mysterious gap between Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and chapter 1, verse 2. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. What had happened between verses 1 and 2? Perhaps this was when the great fall from the heavenly places occurred. Perhaps this was when Satan and his legions fell and brought darkness upon the world. Then God Almighty moved upon that darkness, and the Spirit of God brooded upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Chapter 1, verse 3. God began a work of recreation. He recreated the earth, put man upon it, and started things all over again. Then the fall came, and it looked as if man was lost forever. I think Milton was right in Paradise Lost when he pictured Satan as saying, I think that I can do God more harm by injuring his human race than I can by trying to injure him. So he gave up the idea of taking heaven by military storm. Instead, he came to the garden and tempted the woman. After the human race was fallen, it looked as if God's plans once more had been controverted and that God could not now carry on his plan to fill his world with a people made after his own image. Once I heard a southern preacher describe the first Adam as a wheel spinning on an axle. When the wheel flew off the axle, God put the last Adam on. That's a good way to describe it. When the first Adam was fouled, the second Adam stepped in. In fact, he's been in the plan of God from the beginning of creation. God had his way in the whirlwind and the storm, and made the clouds of history to be the dust of his feet. When the Israelites were in Egypt, God wanted to take them back to the promised land. God said, Let my people go, Exodus chapter 7, verse 16. But Egypt, exercising its little authority which God had allowed it to have, refused to let them go. Then came the clouds that were the dust of God's feet, the ten terrible plagues which God sent out of heaven to strike down the ten gods of Egypt. And when it was all over, there was a death in every home in Egypt. But Israel was free, singing the song in the fifteenth chapter of Exodus. They were free on the other side of the Red Sea, while the terrible armies of Egypt were all dead men. When history goes along with God, all is well. When history goes contrary to the ways of God, then there is storm and flood and fire. But when it's over, God has his way in the whirlwind and the storm, and makes the clouds to be the dust of his feet. When Jesus Christ our Lord was born, I would think he was an average baby boy who couldn't hold his head up, couldn't speak, had no teeth, and I suppose very little hair. Poor helpless little lad. If they left him alone even for a little while, he'd have died. He had the true helplessness of a baby, and he hadn't been born very long when Herod issued the order that all the babies in Bethlehem should be slain. Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. Here God Almighty allowed, in the irony of history, that this tiny piece of humanity, so small he had to be nursed to sleep on his mother's bosom, would be arrayed against the whole Roman Empire. But look who won! Before many decades had gone by, the Roman Empire went down into dust and disgrace, but the baby Jesus grew to manhood, was crucified, and rose again from the dead. God raised him up and seated him up yonder so that the baby that once stood opposed to the Roman Empire now looks down upon an empire that doesn't exist anymore. I remember back in the days of Stalin, early leader of the Soviet Union, he was quoted as saying, We will pull that bearded god out of the sky. But the god who looked down upon chaos and said, Let there be light, who looked down upon Egypt and said, Let my people go, who looked down upon the Roman Empire and said, You can't slay my son, but allowed that empire to slay itself. That god looked down quietly upon Stalin and heard him say, We will pull that bearded god out of the sky. But that great God Almighty is still in his sky. Stalin, on the other hand, is dead. They've pickled him and put him on display in the Kremlin the one who was going to pull the bearded god out of the sky. But the god who makes the whirlwinds of history to be the dust of his feet looks with a pitying smile upon one of the worst men that ever lived. 
It says in the book of Revelation, how I love this passage, it is beautiful to me, though I don't have to know all that it means. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. A rainbow is just a half circle. It starts at the horizon, arches around, and stops at the horizon. But this rainbow made a full circle, as though God were saying the green emerald rainbow, meaning immortality and endlessness, circles my throne. No one can destroy God. Sovereignty in the Crucifixion God's sovereignty was seen at Jesus' death. He had lived his life on earth among men. He was thirty-three years old, and the time came when he should have been king over Israel, so the people thought. They even tried to make him king by force, John chapter 6, verse 15, but he said no. So they took him and nailed him on the cross. I heard a Welsh preacher say one time, and I think he's right, that the disciples never thought anybody could nail Jesus on the tree, that they never believed Jesus could die. They believed that this man, this wondrous man, that could still the waves, heal the sick, cast out the devil, and make the blind to see, could not die. Or if he died, they believed he would immediately rise again in majesty and be king over Israel. And yet there he lay, hanging on a cross. They came and took him down. With great sadness and tears they wrapped him up in his burial robes. They used ointments to try to give him some kind of embalming, and laid him in Joseph's new tomb. A few days later two men walked alone on the road to Emmaus. And as they walked, a man arrived beside them and said to them, I'm paraphrasing here, Why do you look so sad? Why are your voices so low? Why do you seem so depressed? They replied, You must be a stranger in Jerusalem. Don't you know that a great prophet arose, and we believed he was the Son of God? And we didn't believe he could die, or if he died, we believed he would rise. Now this is the third day, and nothing has happened, and all our hopes have caved in. There's nothing but bleak discouragement before us. And he began to talk to them. As he talked, he acted as if he was going to continue on, so they invited him to stay and eat. When he broke the bread, they saw the nail prints in his hands. So they looked at each other, and he disappeared from their sight. They leaped to their feet and said, Did not our heart burn? See Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 32. God Almighty came down and did the wonderful miracle of all miracles. He raised from the grave a man that had died and glorified him. And so the sovereign God had his way in the whirlwind and the storm again. Today we are entering a period in history the likes of which there has never been since Jesus Christ and the Roman Empire stood opposed to one another. The God who lived back then lives now, so I have no fear and no doubt. I can sleep restfully because I believe that God has his plans and will carry them out. What are the plans of God? For one thing, there are God's promises to Abraham and to Israel. God made them, and God will carry them out. God said to Abraham that his descendants would have the land, and he said to Israel that he would reign over the house of Jacob forever. I believe that God will fulfill his promises to Abraham and Israel. I don't think that there is any possibility of stopping God from doing it. God has also decreed that a ransomed company would be called and glorified. Right after the Second World War, missionaries began to say that there were only so many more years left for missionary activity. Young people that felt called to the mission field didn't go because they said, what's the use of getting ready for the mission field? It looks as if the doors are closing, one after another. But you can be absolutely certain that the God who is perfectly free anywhere, all the time, to do everything He wills to do, will carry out His purposes. 
and one of his purposes is to bring forth a ransomed people from every tongue, people, tribe, nation, color, race, and ethnic origin around the world. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. He will make them to be like his holy son, and they will be the bride of his.